Hey everyone, this is Jay, and I'm Sean, and we watched a movie. Oh, we did. Yeah, actually we didn't. I watched a movie. You did, you've been working hard. <laughs> I have been, <laughs> and it was hard. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about two new documentaries on Netflix, and I think you didn't see either of them. I don't think so. Uh, but they were better than the like fiction stuff that they released this week. Well, that's something. So, We've got Mucho Mucho Amor, The Legend of Walter Mercado. Now, does that name ring any bells for you? Not at all. No way. Uh, it didn't for me either. And uh, as this documentary makes clear, we are in the minority on that. Um, this guy, well, he was Spanish speaking. He's from Puerto Rico. So he was really big in anywhere that had even the slightest bit of a Spanish market. Which, Which Canada, really. yeah, <laughs> With it, we have our own secondary language and it's not Spanish. Um, not to say it wasn't available here, it probably was somewhere, somewhere in the long list of channels for people who had cable, not me. Yeah, it's true, we, there was Telemundo or Telelatino or both. Okay, so you may have clipped by him. Is okay. That, is that what you called it in the olden days when you had a remote? Yeah. Okay. Surfed. Surfed. Channel surfed. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so this guy was like a TV psychic. Oh, okay. Yeah. The world's biggest TV psychic and maybe even the first. I wonder how much competition there was for that title. Well, I mean, I definitely had seen psychics on like late night TV. Like I saw on infomercials of Call My 900 number. Yeah. Is that what he did? Um, not, not at first. Uh, in the 90s, definitely. Okay. It became that. Um, but he started out in like 1969. So yeah, he was a big, big deal. Wow. Uh, yeah, he started out doing like he was just on a show and he just improvised. Well, not improvised. He has a gift. He used his <laughs> gift to just do this little segment and people loved it so much and the phone lines lit up that he got his own like recurring segment which turned into his own one hour television show. And uh, yeah, he was apparently, I mean, so beloved by people, really beloved by people. His number one fan may be Lin-Manuel Miranda. Oh, he was okay. on this documentary, not just to like sing his praises and remember watching him with his grandmother. Well, that's sweet. But he like got to meet him and he was like fangirling about it like <laughs> big time. Couldn't like, you know, somebody that big, somebody who meant something to you as a kid, it almost feels like they're not a person. And even though yes. he is in show business himself and realizes that they are people, it was like a big moment for him. Yeah, I it was can really see that. cute. Yeah, that is cute. Um, but a lot of people know and really love this guy. And apparently it's really like, ha he's had kind of a resurgence with, you know, the, the young kids now, millennials, I guess, who like have made him into memes and stuff, but they too watched with their grandparents and they, so they know this guy. And he is kind of the kind of guy that might do well today just because he was so, like such a character for his time. It's hard to even, believe that especially from like a deeply lots of deeply religious markets that a guy who did not look like a guy necessarily he definitely was gender bending a little bit i mean and asexual i think is what he describes himself as well I, you know he's not one for labels i should say but whatever he is it's an other and um Although he never discussed what he was, uh, he certainly wore it proudly. Um, my gosh, his personal style was a revelation to me. <laughs> Whew, I, 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 you know, I felt like it was crossed with like, like all of the big, like Liberace and Elvis only like more. Oh, he yeah. saw the Liberace, he saw you and Elvis and he raised you. Oof. Ten RuPaul's? Yeah. And like a Lando Calrissian. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, he he loves has capes? a cape for <laughs> every occasion. Like, we got to see his cape closet, and holy cow, 
It's major. <laughs> um, his face is more like, you know, Joan Collins, Joan Riversy. Like to, and he has a very like stylish grandma haircut and has for like ever. Uh, so I think to see him, you probably might mistake him for a woman. And I think, you know, none of that matters to him. What matters to him is telling people their futures. Um, he's very big into astrology, so that's sort of the medium he uses. Uh, but basically people remember him as being mostly just a light of positivity. Which, you know, people do like to hear. Yes. <laughs> and so he, he liked to confirm that you were maybe going to have a good week or tell you what your strengths were. And so people really remember him bringing that into their lives every day in, you know, newspaper syndications and television shows. And then he hooked up with a business manager. Uh-oh. Yeah. Has there ever been a business manager that didn't rip off a person? I know. <laughs> and I mean, this guy, Walter Mercado, is a real sweetie. He seems extremely loyal. He, his personal assistant, Willie, has been a personal assistant since almost day one. They're more like brothers, you know, they're family for sure. Willie knows everything about him, every preference, takes good care of him. He warned us not to get too bitchy with him. <laughs> I don't know what Willie does to anyone who's bitchy to Walter, but you don't want to get on the wrong side of that. Um, and at the outset of his relationship with the business manager, Bill Bakula, it was rosy at first, of course, but uh, Walter Mercado is an artist and a prime astrologer, but he's not a business guy. He trusted people and he signed his name to a lot of documents. And at the end of the day, what that meant is that he, he no longer had the right to his name or any of his material. So, yeah, so by the 90s, when, you know, the business manager had cranked out all those 900 numbers and had psychics around the world, uh, it kind of came crashing down and they had to go to court. So yeah, it's a sad story. Um, and a lot of people just, you know, lost track of him because he, he wasn't able to even use his own name right. at that point. So he wasn't visible and he never really came back after it. So people, I think, wondered what happened to that guy? Where is that guy who figured so large and then just, basically disappeared. So this was his reappearance. And um, he's quite a guy. I loved hearing his stories. He like, he really believes in his own legend. He has an origin story better than any superheroes. <laughs> he's got superpowers, obviously, obviously. And he's got a nemesis. So yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't follow Edna Mode's strict advice for superheroes. No no capes, that's right. And like his are like so jewel encrusted, they are probably weigh like 30 to 50 pounds, maybe, <laughs> like, depending on the cape. So yeah, there's a, uh, <laughs> he has to live a quieter life, I guess, with capes like those. Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. Anyways, super interesting guy. I never even heard of him before, and yet I still enjoy this documentary. Well, that is an interesting uh, category of documentaries, is to learn something new. Mm -hmm. And it does sound like this is a person <laughs> worth learning about yeah. that has a different, <laughs> unique life. That's right. So I really enjoyed that. I also enjoyed Father, Soldier, Son. So, you know, let's do a whole 180 here. This is a very different kind of documentary. Um, about a family where dad goes off to war. And in fact, dad is the only parent in the house. He's a single dad. The mother is not in the picture. And he leaves behind two very young sons. So thank goodness for Uncle Sean, who cares for them what while nice dad guy. is gone to war. And when we first meet the kids, they're like seven and 12 maybe. They're really little guys. And they have this like, 
sort of puffed up sense of their hero dad who goes off to war and he's practically like Captain America to them. Um, but they do worry about him. You know, they do understand the possibilities. Um, and they're just lonely for him. They're lonesome for the only parent they have. And I think that's a really hard thing, especially when you're a single parent, to not have either parent there. Mm -hmm. That's got to be really hard. I mean, it clearly is very hard. We do yeah. see how hard it is. Um, even when he comes back, you know, there are tears because you missed him so much, but tears also because he's going to leave you again. And he does. But he comes home sooner than we thought because he gets wounded in Afghanistan. And um, he comes back with a limp, but also emotional wounds. And so I think that's really where the documentary shines, is because we do talk a lot about mental health uh, for our returning soldiers and how lacking that has been. Well, that's good because it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable to me, especially in the U.S., mm -hmm. where you glorify war and all these great heroes that you send off to get mm -hmm. slaughtered. And then the ones that do make it home are just out on the streets yeah. with no support. Yes. So, um, you know, he has obviously a crippling disability physically. And I think just emotionally trying to deal with not being the same man because he physically can't do the things he wanted to do with his kids, but he also can't, he can't be in the army anymore. He's not fit for duty. So he has guilt about that, which obviously is crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> and if, you know, he tries really hard to keep his leg, um, but eventually they have to amputate and then he kind of wishes he had amputated from the beginning. But then the rehab is lengthy and harder than he thought, and he never really re even regains stuff after the amputation. Like it's it's really a tough road for him. But as much as we see him struggling physically, the emotional toll that that has taken, you know, and how it reflects on his family and his boys. This is over a period of ten years, which is really really great because as his boys age and mature we really do get to see how they think differently now maybe about what sacrifice means and and what a commitment serving your country is and um yeah it's it's really kind of devastating to see i think we owe this family and all of the families like them a lot more because um yeah it's it's pretty devastating it's hard to watch at times and these are sweet kids and you want to see them do well and they've just had a hard a hard time already down one parent and now the parent that they have is not the one that they sent you know he comes back a different man and not just because he's down a leg but he, you know he's short to temper and he's angry and for a while he loses himself in video games like he just wants to play war video games yeah. to be back there and he ignores his kids and you don't doubt for a minute that he loves them. He really does. But this is just, you know, depression and, and his coping mechanism. So yeah. that's tough. You know, you really do see the weight of it on the entire family. Well, that's good, because mm -hmm. obviously it is uh, a big deal for everyone involved mm -hmm. when someone goes off overseas to a combat zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just that person who is exactly. dealing with it. Mm -hmm. It's everyone they know, everyone they love, everyone who loves them. Mm -hmm. And then That's when right. they come back and, yeah, aren't the same, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Because you've never hit, no matter what, you no, know. No, you're not coming back the same. No, I think one way or another Even there are if you're physically there. healthy. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do that kind of work. And especially when it's, you know, criticized and maybe not the right thing. It's hard to come back to this reality here where where people are more outspoken about that. Yep. And you do start to wonder, was it worth it? What was it all for? Well, it's a, you know, what was it all for? Mm -hmm. What is any of it all for? Like, these are not wars that are making progress, that yeah. are showing a tangible result. Mm -hmm. 
that's the thing. We we do watch them for an entire decade, and guess what? That war. No, we haven't it's had. It's just always in the background. We so haven't it's always had a one trigger for him yeah, too. For sure, it's that's must be true. It's yeah. still going on. Mm -hmm. And like to see, like he recognizes on the news, you know, a village where he was stationed, and literally feels like all that time and nothing, nothing. Like, yeah, that's really tough. Well, that must be tough. And yeah. I think you know we we know a lot more now than we did for World War II, mm -hmm. but it must also be easier in World War II because at least then you can point to a result mm -hmm. where you say, that was worth it. Yes. We don't get that anymore. No, that's right. So, you know, it's a very, I won't say a heavy watch. I think the, the directors really took care of that. It's emotional for sure. It's very moving. Um, it is tough. It's very tough to see this family in crisis and like it, this is a sustained wound that we're talking about. A tragedy that, that does leak for many, many, many years and generationally. Um, and just imagine the editing on a 10 year project. Like this is really an impressive work and I thought it really told the story well. So I do think people should check it out, even Sean. Well, then I will. <laughs> I know, I think you probably will. It's very good. So yeah, two documentaries. I loved them both. Couldn't be more different from each other. No kidding. Uh, you know, start maybe with Father, Soldier, Son, and then you can cheer yourself up with the incredible Walter Mercado. Who apparently will tell you that everything's going to be just fine. Well, it's got to be true sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye.